intelligencesquared.com. Right, now we're going to go over to the, uh, the final speeches, just two to three minutes. And while um, that's happening, the ushers are going to go round, and you're going to have a chance to cast your ballot box, your, your ballot in the box. Um, so <laughs> make your mind up. Don't cast the ballot box. That's what some happens when things get rowdy. Um, <coughs> but we're going to go in reverse order now um, from the uh, one we, 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 uh, we started with. So I'm going to ask Kwasi uh, Kwarteng, don't need to go to the podium, Kwasi, you can oh, okay. do it from here, it uh, saves time. Great. Um, please um, respond to anybody sure. you like from the floor or from the panel um, in two to three minutes. Well, there are a lot of points raised. I felt that the, the central issue of the debate um, revolves around causality, which was raised by, I think, the first um, question. No one is saying that all the problems of these countries derived exclusively from the British imperial experience. No one has, say, has ever said that. But what we are saying is that there are certain structural features of British imperial rule that had direct consequences today and for which people in the colonies continued to blame Britain. Now this leads to the second point. Someone talked about blame. You know, what is the point of blame? Um, I'm not a linguistic philosopher. But blame, I think, is simply a, a, a measure of apportioning responsibility. So if someone kicks a glass of water and it ruins my fur coat or my coat, I can blame them and by apportioning that responsibility. It doesn't mean that I have to beat them up or that I, I can't get on with the rest of my day. But I can accept that there is some responsibility for this bad thing happening and I can blame them. That's all it means. It doesn't mean that you, 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 you tear your hair out or you, you um, ask even for reparations. I don't, think that, uh, I, I don't think there is a case, really, for reparations. I mean, where does that end? We could be asking going to Rome to ask reparations for Ro the Roman Empire. I mean, it, you know, the, the, there's got to, you've got to draw a line at some point. But blame is, is, is a strong word. But all it means is that it recognizes responsibility. And I think it's indisputable that in today's environment, in today's world, there are many uh, conflicts, uh, corruption, someone mentioned corruption, particularly in Nigeria. This is a direct consequence of British decisions made in, under the British Empire. Nigeria was created as a country, as a state, under the British Empire. And because it has different um, tribal groupings, different ethnicities, there's a very weak sense of state. Now, you don't have to be a political scientist to realize that where there is a weak state, a weak notion of state, uh, you're very likely to have corruption. And it was this case even now, I think, in Italy, because Italy is a new country. So people feel much more attached to their region, to the south of Italy or to their town or to their family, than they do to the state. So the creation of Nigeria is a direct consequence of the British Empire. And without the British Empire, Nigeria would not have been constituted as it is today. So dealing with blame and causality, um, I'd like to move on uh, to um, specifics. Yes. It is right to say that not every colony had the same experience. But all the motion suggests is that where there is blame, um, people in the colonies should continue to blame, should, should recognize. So it's an act of recognition to realize where you've come from and say, yes, this is why we're here. This was what caused um, our particular situation. That doesn't mean you keep wallowing in it or you ask for sympathy. It's just a question of recognizing where you've come from what the causes of particular phenomenon are, and then moving on. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Kwasi. We're going to go straight next to uh, Ramachandra um, for the motion, summing up. Thank you, and thank you for all your fascinating questions. I'll just make two uh, concluding reflections. One is on <coughs> a comparative study of empires. I quoted Ho Chi Minh. Now, what Ho Chi Minh suggested was that, unlike the French, the British could be embarrassed by nonviolent protest. I think uh, the British were more gentlemanly than the French. They were also more Philistine. I think if we'd been ruled by the French, maybe our cuisine and our music and our sense of dress would have been mutually compatible. Uh, but I think there's a more interesting comparison to be made with the empire that Gita talked about, the current empire, the United States. 
Uh, the gentleman uh, there was absolutely right. It's only in Britain that you could have a debate like this. The British are obsessed with their role with empire, and it's quite interesting that uh, a conservative MP is so anguished about all the horrors that the empire has allegedly committed. Now, if you go to America, it's impossible. The Americans don't even believe they have an empire because they're so innocent. You know, it's, 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 it's a country born in innocence, and they won't, just won't discuss it. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is to go to... Um, uh, the motion itself. Should the colonies blame the British? Now, there are two parts here. One part uh, was indicated by Gandhi and later by Mandela, and I'll, I'm so glad that the South African uh, experience was mentioned. Gandhi's closest friend was an English Christian priest, C.F. Andrews. If you admired Gandhi, like many Indians did, you called him Mahatma or Bapu. If you disliked Gandhi, as many Indians did too, you called him Mr. Gandhi. In fact, Jinnah and Ambedkar and the communists only called him M.K. Gandhi. But the only person to call him Mohan was an Englishman by the name that his mother gave him. So Gandhi, I think, set the precedent, which was later f followed by Nehru, which is why there's still a commonwealth. Incidentally, there's a commonwealth because Nehru played a crucial role in the first and second meetings. Uh, there's also so that a republic, and India is a republic, could be included in the commonwealth. And Nehru again played a crucial role in kicking apartheid South Africa out of, uh, out of the Commonwealth. And of course, then many years later, South Africa was welcomed back. So there are two parts. There's the Gandhi Mandela path. And there is, if you will, the Mugabe Mahatir path. Now, I think this is a stark choice between people of the former colonies. Uh, and I think the Indians, by and large, have chosen wisely. So too have the South Africans. And maybe the other countries in Asia and Africa should take a lesson from them. Thanks very much indeed, uh, Ramachandra. And um, I'm now going to go to uh, Richard, Richard Gott. Uh, just uh, three replies. Um, somebody said the Commonwealth was flourishing. I think if they'd been following the news of the recent Commonwealth Conference, they wouldn't say that it was flourishing. Uh, the question about Libya, whether we can put Libya in the same bracket as Iraq and Afghanistan. I think most people have forgotten that we ran Libya for 10 years after World War II. It's about the same time that we ran Iraq and Afghanistan in the 19th century. So it is very similar, um, and I think we should think about it in the same terms, but I don't think anybody mentioned it during the recent war. And lastly, somebody made a question about blaming. Uh, does, it, does it help to uh, try and discuss blame? Um, and what I think is important, and is probably important for everybody in this room, is I think it's very important for countries to learn their own history. The trouble is, if you live in a former British colony, and you look back at your own history, there is this sort of vast block of ice in the history, which is the British. Whereas, curiously, although um, Rama thinks that we're, we're very obsessed by empire in this country, we don't actually look back at our history and think about the empire. It's very, very detached from the history of Britain. Uh, I think it should be um, more intimately linked. And I just want, lastly, to say something about we, we, we've managed to avoid sort of home politics, um, but we have an MP on either side for each party. And I'm just quite intrigued by the by, by the nature of the political debate in this country about empire, because uh, on the whole, I think Tony Blair apologized a bit for the Irish famine, but not for the sort of general repression of Ireland. But um, David Cameron went to Islamabad earlier this year talking about Kashmir, and he said, as with so many of the world's problems, we are responsible for the issue in the first place. I don't think he quite meant to say that, but I think it was an extremely brave thing to do. Um, and I think it's really odd, in a way, that somehow, sometimes the conservatives seem to say the right things about empire. Well, I, I think that may be a kind of historic moment, and you should just savor it. Um, um, Gita. OK, I'm going to um, start from the point that Richard ended, which is thinking about how conservatives are talking about empire and uh, 
you know, wishing to keep it alive, whereas a laborite might be wishing to put the issue of empire away. I think of Neil Ferguson, who um, was the, a former Philippe Bromont professor of imperial history at LSE. And um, I think about his book and his television series and why these were so popular. And to me, it smacks of trying to keep something alive that has kind of died a long time ago. And, uh, you know, even though he says, oh, yes, you know, Britain did some wonderful things, everyone's past it. And part of the reason his book gained popularity is because it was trying to bring up a subject that a lot of people are interested in within Britain, but a lot of people have moved away from elsewhere. Now, I'd also like to say that um, if we think about the role of empire, you know, you could say that actually the British Empire was taking place in this late Victorian period during a time that the rules of the game generally in the international system was changing. So, for example, these changes that somebody was talking about, the structures and systems for them that were surrounding the Maori people might have changed anyway because we had processes of modernization and globalization taking place in any case across the world. And with advances in modern medicine, which is part of modernization, we also had um, uh, discoveries like quinine that allowed Europeans to infiltrate a place. Now, they, did they have to annex a place and form a colony per se? Not necessarily, but they likely would have continued to trade deeper into areas that th than they could have. Um, and I'd just like to bring up a point about um, uh, uh, there's a famous article, was the wealth of nations determined in 1000 BC? So if we want to think about the different positions economically of different nations, apparently um, this article says that there's an association between economic wealth, per capita incomes, and technological adoption. So if we think that certain areas adopted technologies and that made them more advanced and we could actually form a trajectory from that time to now, I think we can see the role of empire. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Gita. And now Ashley to wind up against the motion. Well, I'll just say that one's view of the British Empire, of course, tends to depend upon one's vantage point. And the vantage point at the receiving end should be considered every bit as significant as that of the armchair viewers back home. Must the British Empire really be depicted, Andrew Roberts asks, as a tale of slavery, plunder, war, corruption, exploitation, indentured labor, impoverishment, massacres, genocide, and forced resettlement? Or could some objectivity, he says, be re-injected into the debate? Well, frankly, yes, it must. After listing such a catalog of ills, though of course denying none of them, this call for objectivity is puzzling. What are we to do? Throw cricket and the English language into the equation to balance out genocide and slavery and call it a draw? To say that India's all right, Jack, and that Britain should deal with its irrelevance? That simply doesn't work for most former colonies in the world. The British Empire, as one wag said, was nasty, brutish, and in shorts. To a sufficiently wide degree, it suppressed the ambitions of others whilst denying them a controlling stake in their own affairs and was at root exploitative, not altruistic, even if that veneer and self-justificatory myth became very much a part of the British agenda and the British debate, and still is. So too is the international system in which these former colonies now struggle for any measure of power one of the most lasting legacies. And of course, the whole point about America, this is just a nonsense. America is the continuation of this form of empire. Settlerism and settler colonialism is what we're looking at, not just the British or the French or the Spanish empires. And another point on that is the fact Niall Ferguson, his whole book was saying the British empire was great. His next book, Colossus, was saying America needs to do more of the same and be more of an empire. That was the whole point of his work. To recap and finally, we need to bear in mind informal imperialism and the continuations of empire. We shouldn't waste time on blame, but seek to understand the causes of today's ills and colonialism's responsibility for them, and thereby to help eradicate those ills, 
it presents a new opportunity for British engagement with the world. Thanks very much indeed, Ashley. And final, final brief perora the peroration from Tristram Hunt. Edward, thank you very much, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for, for being here. What, what has struck me partly about the opposition case is the remarkable lack of historical sophistication surrounding it. The idea that empire was essentially this sort of late Victorian, high Christian, neo-military thing from about 1870 to 1910 has somehow then clouded their entire view of the far more haphazard, fragmentary, complex nature of empire. And so when we begin to think about empire, it is a far more uh, complicated story of interrelationships than simply dominance. But at the heart of this is the question that the world is changing. We might sit here in Cadogan Hall in Chelsea and think the world is about us, but it really is not. And this self-obsession which we've seen that our history is their history, our history determines their history, is simply fallacious. When we have heard the voices of those who live in former uh, colonies, they say time and time again, it is not about you. It is about Pakistan and India. Uh, it is about the people of Kashmir. It is not about the British. And we need to start taking that on board. We also need to think about the multiplicity of the colonial experience. In 1957, there was a celebrated article as to whether South Korea or Ghana uh, would uh, uh, accelerate from their post-colonial status the fastest. And of course, South Korea was. And they have these multiple experiences of empires which go back to their pre-colonial histories. We have to get out of this notion of colonial determinism, denying the historical actors of the past their agency. If we're concerned about colonialism today, we might think about neo-colonialism, uh, as Gita has suggested, in terms of American power, but also Chinese power, also Indian power. These are empires of today, growing empires who are not thinking about our role in their history, but about their future roles. We come back ultimately to the question of should. Should the former colonies blame the British Empire for their ills, and I suggest that they should not do so, because more often than not, it is a motive uh, for other uh, political uh, agendas. So when you have cast your ballot tonight in favor of the motion, and we thank you for that on our side, you have cast it in favor of the Zimbabwean trade unionist who wants to mobilize his workforce. You've cast it in favor of the Burmese peasant who wants to cast her vote. You've cast it in favor of the Kashmiri conscript soldier who wants to go home. You've cast it in favor of the Palestinian farmer who wants to end the occupation of his land. You've cast it in those who are seeking political action, are not looking to blame the past, and are willing to hold their current political actors to account. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, Tristan, and you'll recall that the initial vote was 191 for, 68 against, and don't knows 136. And there's been some very dramatic shifts. First of all, the don't know vote has collapsed down to 20. So I think that whatever else happened, the panel did a jolly good job in uh, abolishing indecision. So that was very good. Um, secondly, the vote against the motion has almost doubled from 68 to 135. So the, those who opposed the motion did a good job in grabbing a chunk of the um, don't knows. But those supporting the motion have gone from 191 to 245. So I declare the motion very solidly carried. And please join me in thanking the speakers.